you know, when Sandy was talking about her grandparents having been in um, Germany as soldiers during the First World War, I uh, knew that my, both my grandparents had also fought for Germany during the First World War. Now that's interesting because I grew up in France and my father was a very, very patriotic Frenchman and I kind of thought that we had always been French. But the truth is that while my mother's family had been in Germany for many centuries, uh, my fa uh, my my father's family lived in Alsace-Lorraine. Alsace is a, uh, 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 I guess you could call it a county on the border of Germany and France, and it has always gone back and forth. So for example, in 1870, there was the Franco-Prussian War. The French lost, Alsace went to Germany. In 1918, the Germans lost, and Alsace went back to France. So what I thought was my French family wasn't always French, although I understand that many of my relatives left, uh, left Alsace after 1870 and scattered to various countries, including the United States. But anyways, um, so my mother was born in Germany, and my mother, uh, my mother, when after Hitler came to power, which was in 1933, she left France. And she left. I'm sorry. She left Germany and went to France in 1934. Now you have to think about that a little bit. Because she was a young girl, she was in her early 20s, she had no uh, training, she did not know French, she knew German, and so it was very brave of her. She went all by herself, which was very unusual at that time. And she was a nanny, she became a nanny, she uh, took a sewing class so she could sew clothes. In fact, when I was a baby, a little girl, she uh, sewed all the clothes. In the meantime, <coughs> my grandfather, my French grandfather, who was a butcher, you know, there was, um, lost all his money. You know, there was a depression here in the late 20s and 30s, and there was also a depression in Europe. And so he went bankrupt. He had two butcher shops. And he went bank, and my father used to work for him. That's a difference also between the United States and uh, Europe at that time. My father really wanted to become an architect, but his father was a butcher, and that's what he became. My, uh, it helped him later, but enough of that. So anyways, my mother met my father. They got married in 36. I was born in 1937. Now the war in Europe started in 1939, September 1939, when Hitler invaded Poland. And my father, of course, being a um, patriotic Frenchman, and also just, he was drafted, went into the French army when Hitler Hitler um, invaded France in what is known as the Phony War. It lasted only a few weeks. In the meantime, I stayed with my grandparents, my paternal grandparents, and my mother in Jex, which was near Switzerland, which is another part of the story. Um, I still remember I was maybe four, uh, or five, and I still remember that we lived right across the street from the German headquarters, and I used to see the soldiers walking back and forth across the street in front. Uh, there were sentries in front of the uh, in front of the headquarters. Anyhow, 
My father, when he was demobilized, <coughs> was left in the so-called unoccupied part of France, which was really run by the, a puppet government, uh, and, my, and we were in the occupied part. And so we were not allowed, <coughs> we were not allowed to travel because we were Jewish. Um, in fact, I still remember that my mother and my grandparents had to wear the yellow star. I didn't because I was under six. And so between 1939 and, and 1942, or 19, I saw my father once. We went to a place where they had a, uh, it was like a railroad, you know, a railroad gate, and we had to talk across the gate. Anyways, this leads me to my first upstander, because my story is really a story about upstanders. And I don't know if you learned anything about upstanders yet, but you will. These are people who at great risk to their own lives um, helped others because they felt that what was going on was not right. So we had a neighbor. Monsieur Fournier, and he said he was a hunter and he knew the woods. By the way, this is mountainous country. I said it was near Switzerland. And <clears throat> he said to my mother, I can take you through the woods till you, we can get a place where you can take your saw off and you can get on the train. And so he did. My mother, Monsieur Fournier and my mother walked all day from maybe six in the morning to six or seven at night till she was able to take her star off and go on the train. Now mind you, while they were walking through the woods, they did see a squadron of German soldiers. And my mother, who was a very quick thinker, uh, always in her whole life. She had like a suit jacket on and so she turned the um, collar over so that they couldn't see her star and they didn't stop them. They didn't ask them for their identification and um, so that's she rejoined my father. In the meantime I was staying with my uh, grandparents and my Mother wanted us to rejoin them, wanted me to rejoin them. And my grandparents were really against it. You know, they said, we, we have plenty of food here. Nobody's going to hurt us because, you know, we haven't done anything to anybody. We're good citizens. We mind our business. He worked in, by the way, he got a job in a slaughterhouse. Um, you know, we're good people, we don't hurt anybody, we're not bothering anybody. They just, it was very hard for people to believe that this was happening. But my mother, who had a very long memory, remembered that during the First World War, she had been, gone to live with her grandparents for four years. And when she had to go home to her mom and dad, she was very upset because she had lived with them you know, between the ages of three and seven. And my grandmother, her mother, was very strict and not, you know, not a very nice woman. I mean, she was okay, but she wasn't very warm, let me put it that way. My mother was really upset. As a child, she never forgot it. And she said, no, 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 Jacqueline has to come. She has to come. So this, this is really upstander number two. The same Monsieur Fournier who had helped, uh, who had helped uh, my mother, pretended I was his daughter. I was five. This was in 1942. And if we were stopped, I had to say my name is Josiane Fournier, which was the name of his daughter. He took me on the train. Thank goodness no one asked me anything. So that was 
you know, because I really don't know how long as a five-year-old I could have told this lie. So thank goodness, and my mother met us someplace in the middle at a train station, and uh, she picked me up, and I remember that she had found some fellow by the train who was selling carrots, so she had an empty suitcase because she was pretending to go somewhere, to be going somewhere. And so she filled up the, the suitcase with carrots and for weeks I felt as though I had nothing but. I hated carrots with a passion. My grandparents were correct. We, we could. For example, my father once brought home a rabbit and um, I thought it was a pet. They put it in the uh, basement to, you know, fatten him up in the cage, and of course it was to eat. I couldn't eat it because I was too upset. Things like that, but I was never hungry. And very much later on, my mother told me, and of course as a five, six year old, I didn't understand this, that sometimes she had a potato, she would eat the peel, and she would give me the potato. There was another instance of um, upstanding. My father had a job all the way through the war. Now, you weren't supposed to give Jews a job, but the manager of a the rayon factory, it was a rayon factory, we lived in factory housing, gave him the job and kept him on, also at some risk. In the interim, Monsieur Fournier was trying to get my grandparents to go to Switzerland, which was like 18 kilometers away, because Switzerland was neutral, which meant that if you could get in, you'd be safe. And he also, knowing the backwards, and for whatever reason, my grandparents didn't go. And so one day, <clears throat> in February of 44, so kind of late during the war, that's when the Nazis were really rounding up everybody. They were arrested. And uh, I have a letter, that, or a facsimile of a letter, that I have. And my uh, grand grandfather said, this, uh, my dear ones, uh, this evening we were arrested by the French police and tomorrow at 7.30 they're going to take us to Dijon, which is another uh, town. Don't worry yourselves about us. If God wills it, they will not lock us up. And, you know, love and kisses, and my grandmother said, don't worry yourself. Everything will arrange itself for the best. Also love and kisses. So they were arrested. They were put in a transit camp, Drancy, which uh, was a little north of Paris. Three weeks later, on March 7th, 1944, they were put on one of the boxcars that you'll see downstairs. And they, uh, they arrived in Auschwitz on March 10th, 1944, where we think they were probably immediately killed because my grandfather was 70 and my grandmother was 66. And out of the over 1,000 people that went on that convoy, only 34 ever returned and only 14 of them were women. How do I know all this? Know why they, they, the Germans kept really, really good records. And uh, we have a book in our library. I really haven't looked at it lately, but I can look it up and I can see, <coughs> see the date. We know the date when they were arrested. See the date when they got in the train and the three days it took them to get to Auschwitz. Anyway, so that was a case where here these were these older people living in a small town 
and nobody helped them the way I was helped. Sorry. It's a long time ago and they still get a little emotional many times when I'm talking about it. All right, so that was it. Now my father uh, joined the French Resistance and the French Resistance were pe people who didn't want the Nazis in France and were trying to uh, get rid of them. And um, so we found out, we always used to find out when the Nazis were coming to pick us up. And uh, I, I figured out later, and I wish I had asked my father, that uh, because there were no, no, there was not a German headquarters in the town where we lived. They had to come from a bigger town. And so they must have put down, you know, tomorrow we're going to pick up the ox. Uh, my name was ACH. And we always found that. I figured that they, the uh, resistance had probably infiltrated the offices. And so they found out. So they, uh, like one night, I remember we slept in the bushes all night. And I was all scratched up. Another night, an, a friend who was also in the resistance, you know, let us sleep. So they never got to us, even though they knew we were there. But I guess for one family, you know, it wasn't, they didn't look that hard. They must have put it down on some board. You know, you see sometimes some police, they put down things on boards and somebody knew and somebody let us know. And as I said before, I wish I had asked my dad um, exactly how we found out. But you know, so I'm telling you um, young people, if you want to find out about your history, you should ask your grandparents or your uncle, uncles and aunts or even your mother and father because sometimes we find things out. Uh, but I had other things on my mind because I was a little kid. Um, anyways, uh, on June 6, 1944, there was D-Day. And that's when the um, that's when uh, the the Allies landed in Normandy, <coughs> and uh, so my father and his friends in the resistance, who had been fighting by doing various things, uh, decided to fight more openly, and they went into the mountains. Um, my sister was born on June 12th. And I still remember that about three weeks later, my father came down to look at her. He had camouflage on and everything. My sister, of course, had to be born at home. Not because we were primitive, because I had been born in the hospital. But if she had gone to the hospital, she would not have come out. Neither my sister nor my mother. So friends, again friends, uh, and somebody who acted as a midwife uh, helped my sister come into the world. Um, and that's another thing. She was named Joseph, Josette. Now, <clears throat> in the Jewish religion, it's not customary to name someone after somebody who's alive. But my mother was wondering, what should I name this child? And one of her friends said, well, Joseph, my father's name may not come back, so why don't you name her after him? And, um, and by the way, my two middle names are my grandmother's names. They were alive at the time, but I think that it was 1937 and my father knew that bad things might happen and that's why I'm named after two living, at the time, two living people. Um, so it, then it became very, very dangerous for the wives and families of the resistance to be in the town, in this little town. So we went to the mountains also, and I still remember they sent one of the older men 
to help us. And I still remember that we had to walk up hills, so mountains really so steep that he had to hook his cane on the rung of the carriage and pull it up. While we were there, we were bombed. Uh, it was very isolated, and the Germans had not been there before. They were really in retreat by that time. It was already uh, summer of 44, and or even early fall. And then they landed, and they, again, they came and questioned us. Uh, they separated me from my mother, and they asked me questions. I still remember they asked me, where's your father? And I said, no, he, he works in Grenoble. That was the big city. He works in Grenoble. Uh, to this day, I don't remember who told, me, who told me what this, I'm sure my mother did, but I don't remember how I learned all this. Uh, <clears throat> that's never left me, by the way. I'm very reluctant to speak about my private affairs because that's, uh, that was really a lasting, uh, a lasting, what's the word? Impression. <laughs> Because when people ask me, you know, what something private about myself, I v tend to be very closed off, and I think it comes from that. Because it was very dangerous. I couldn't say anything. Anyways, I don't know how they managed it. I think that by that time, you know, these were soldiers. They were young guys, the way soldiers usually are, and especially at the end of the war. The Germans uh, probably uh, were using up all their people. And I think they were probably anxious to get home themselves, I think. That's only what I think. Anyways, um, oh yeah, I said we were bombed. Uh, and I'll never forget that, that we were sitting at the table. There were a couple of families in each farmhouse, and uh, the bomb, uh, when bombs fell, you know, we were sit, uh, the soup bowls went up, the table went up, and then it went down. Nothing got broken. We ran out, and we ran out, and uh, I was so shaken that when it was time to go down, I couldn't walk. I would slid on my behind uh, down the hill. Uh, so anyways, as I said before, so the, the Germans were in retreat, and the way we left was, we left on the back of a German truck sitting on duffel bags, and my sister in her baby carriage, and me and my mother were sitting on the duffel bags, and I don't know what people thought when they saw us riding down. Anyways, well, they dropped us off, and while we were waiting for a trolley car, uh, as one of those small planes came and strafed us with machine guns. And again, we were fortunate, so very fortunate. And um, so we went back home. My father continued to fight. And uh, when the war was ended, you know, my mother's family from Germany had managed to, well, at least her mother her grandmother, her mother, and her three brothers had managed to get to the United States in the late 30s. And in fact, all three of the boys, uh, my mother's brothers, were in the American Army and came to visit us. And I remember they gave me a doll, which was the first doll I'd had since I was a baby, I guess. And uh, my, my mother, I guess, wanted to rejoin her family that was here. And so we did the paperwork and all that. And in 1947, we came to the United States. Uh, we were on the Queen Elizabeth. And in fact, when I was going through my mother's thing, I found a manifest of a tourist class we were in tourist class, which was like third class, <clears throat> and we came to the United States and we went to Chicago because that's where the rest of the family was. And I didn't know any English. I had a wonderful, she
she was also an upstander, Mrs. Sable. Now what did they do? I was 10 years old by that time. What did they do? They didn't have English as a second language. I was the only, I think the only foreign person there. And I was made a lot of fun of um, because of the way I dressed and the way I spoke. But anyways, this was in April of 47, and, this is, and they put me in first grade, which was very humiliating. Uh, but Mrs. Sable, the teacher, she invited me to her house that summer, and I liked to read. I read, you know, I, I went to school in France, and so she had me reading books and things like that. And by September, I went into sixth grade, so I don't know too many people went from first grade to sixth grade in one fell swoop, but that's what I did. And I went on. Uh, I had a pretty miserable time, as I think a lot of immigrants do, especially if they're not living in a place where there are other people that they can relate to. Um, uh, but, you know, I went through high school, I went to college, and married, and had five, uh, through two children, and I have five grandchildren. And uh, that's my story, really. So, if you have any questions, I'd love to take them. And, oh, by the way, I, you know, I think I have to emphasize the importance of being an upstander. That means, when you see something that's going on, it's not right, somebody's bullying, even that's such a small, you think it's a small thing, it's not a small thing. Because if it wasn't for all the people who helped us, I wouldn't be here. I would have been gone, and I always remember that. And, uh, okay. Oh, yes? Me? Whoever. Were you separated from your family? No, actually not. Well, only to in the sense that I was lived with my grandparents, but that's really family. Uh, while my mother had gone before me, yeah. Yes. Um, what kind of job did you have when you were older? I, uh, I was a Children's Protective Services Supervisor. Wow. <laughs> yes? Since you were born into this environment, did you ever have a feeling that it was never going to end? That the you know, I tried to remember what I felt like, but I don't really remember what I felt like. You know, because I was like four, five, six. I mean, the war ended when I was seven, seven and a half. So to go back and remember, I think I tried to forget. I kind of blanked things out, and it was only later that I started thinking about what had happened and, and so forth. And, and I tried, the reason I emphasize upstanders is that I realized after a while, rather than just talking about what happened to me, I realized that was really my story about people who stepped up and that's why I was here, and I realized that. It took me a while to, to kind of focus in on uh, what, what it was, you know, what, what was the, the lesson in all this. And the lesson in all this, and we do try to teach it here, but it's really resonated with me that I was really a, a product, I guess, of a lot of which is probably the wrong word, of a lot of people who, because don't forget, they put their lives on the line for us. They really did. Monsieur Fournier, for example, had two children. His whole family could have wiped out. He certainly could have been wiped out. They really put their lives at risk for basically strangers, people that they knew but not intimately, people who were not in their family, but they, they did it, you know. I wish, I would have loved to ask them, why did they do it? You 
you know, and I think that's a question. Why are people, some people altruistic and other people will see something terrible going on and won't do anything? And this is still a problem today. Okay, this is a never-ending problem. Okay, but what is it? Yeah, yes? I'm sorry? How did you cut tech? I, I couldn't hear. How did I? Contact people. Contact. Oh, contact people? And well, I, I'm not sure I understand your question. You mean during the war? Uh-huh. Yes. Uh, I don't know how my father contacted people, but I'm sure. Well, for example, on D-Day, um, they found out, the people in the resistance found out because the BBC, that's the British Broadcasting Corporation, sent a poem. It was a poem by a famous French poet. In fact, I, I have a copy of the poem on my dresser. And that's how the people in the, under, in the resistance knew that the Allies had landed. Um, so they had different ways. Don't forget, one of the things I need to emphasize is not only didn't we have computers, we didn't, the radio was, we probably had one, uh, one station and it was, it was Nazi controlled, it was German controlled. Uh, if we had a newspaper, which I kind of doubt in the little place we lived, that was also controlled. So people didn't really know a lot of what was, you know, going on, not like today, okay? So, and I think that's probably why my grandparents didn't realize what could happen to them. I don't think they, they realized it because they just didn't. They didn't know. And yes? After you moved to the United States, did you ever see any of those people or try to find them that helped you in your family? Okay. I did not see any of those people again. What you have to remember is, or what we have to understand is, when we came, we had nothing. Because you're only allowed to take out of France, I forget what it was, $25 a piece? At that time, we had nothing. Both my parents had to go to work. I was struggling to learn the language, so I could be like all the other children. So they, I wanted to get dressed like all the other children, because I didn't. I, you know, everybody else had petty loafers, and I had big brown Oxfords. Um, I wanted to dress like the other children. I wanted to be like the other children. That was my focus, was, you know, to try and be as American as possible. I didn't have time to think about those things until I got much, much, much older. Okay, I, because you, you first, the first thing you do is try to survive. Whatever that means, not necessarily getting food, sometimes it means that, but also try to survive in a new society. That's why I was always interested in sociology. That's really what I wanted to be. Because I came from one culture into another, and I wanted to understand things better, how, how, why, why people act the way they do and so forth. That's, that was a big interest. It still is, you know, because I see we make the same mistakes over and over and over and over again. So sometimes I really get depressed about it. Just as a Jewish woman uh, here back in the States. Uh, <laughs> that was another case of cultural misunderstanding. In France, if you ask somebody who's Jewish, who's Catholic, what are you, they say French. They don't say Jewish. 
and that was that was all along. So when people asked me what I was, uh, that's that was not my answer. That I'm Jewish. That was never my answer. You know, when I was young, I'm talking about. I said I'm French. At which time I was made a lot of fun of because you know what they say about French girls, okay? Or they did after the Second World War. Um, maybe you don't, but I. Do. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't realize for a very, very long time that you were, when somebody asked you what the, you were, that basically they were asking you, what religion are you? I didn't know that. Those are all, you know, like subtle, subtle things, you know. So it took me a long time. Also, I had been the only Jew. Jewish uh, young girl in any town I lived in, okay? Just like my family was the only Jewish family. So I really wasn't, it was really, you know, difficult to get acclimated to a different world. Yeah, yes? Have you been able to go back to France and visit or any of those places? I've been, but not to any place where I lived. I mean, I went with my parents, gosh, over 30 years ago, and we visited relatives who were alive at that time, my uncles, and, um, and they lived in the south of France, which is lovely. <coughs> and I was still, actually Facebook is terrific. I'll tell you what, Facebook is good if you don't misuse it. I have been in touch with second cousins now and third cousins that are in France because my father's family basically stayed in France. The ones that were there at the end of the war stayed in France. So I, you know, I, they're much younger than I am, but, you know, we do contact each other or tell each other if a baby is born or things like that. It's, it's nice, but, and then last year for my sister's 70th birthday, we went on a f uh, cruise in, in France, you know, between Paris and, and uh, the South, but we, uh, we were not able to really connect with any family because we were on the ship and we just, yeah, so, yes? When you were young, um, did you ever like make any friends with people that lived around you, or were you very isolated from everyone else? Um, I had a couple of friends, but basically, I would say I was not a very popular person, um, and I did feel different from other people. Um, in fact, it's funny because. Uh, when I went back for my 40th high school reunion and I had written something, you know, they asked you to write something. And they said, everybody said, my God, I didn't know you had been in the Holocaust. Well, I didn't talk about it either. I, you know, and I found they were much nicer than I remembered them. <laughs> yeah. I'm going for my 61st, by the way. And when they didn't have the 60th, I said, what, did everybody die? But, um, anyways, yes. Um, the experience of being shot at, was it very, very frightening? Oh, sure. Oh, sure. And the, uh, the bombing was terribly, I mean, we were so lucky because our house wasn't hit, the house we were living in, but the house next door was just a big hole in the ground. So, you know, I think most survivors that I know of will tell you that a lot of the reason you survive, I mean, some of it is people, yeah, but some of it is also luck. I mean, my whole, you know, my nuclear family, my mother, my father, my sister, and my sister, we all survived. However, I have lots of relatives who died. Um, not so much in France, but in Germany, my mother gave me a list. Uh, I never knew these people. And there were probably 
about 25 people in her family that had been killed, been deported. Um, so, you know, uh, her, her father's sister, who had three children, they were all killed down. I also had a, a great aunt who managed to survive um, with her husband, but her, her daughter and her son were killed. And uh, so, you know, that there were a lot of people who were, and, but as I said, I didn't know many of them personally, so that's, that makes a difference. I just knew my grandparents. Anybody else? Yes? <laughs> Um, I have a two-part question, actually. What language were you speaking when you came to America? French. Can you still speak French? A uh, peu. A little. <laughs> no, I'll tell you, I'm a little rusty. I can still read French, um, but it takes me a while. Like, when my cousins came to visit, they said, you're going to speak French now. And I did. It took me a couple of days to get my fluency back because my, my husband was American, you know, and so I didn't really have anybody to speak to. My mother's family who were here were all German, and I refused to speak German. I was, I understood it, but I refused to speak it. So, but yeah, I would say if, if I go to France, it's, I can get along. It takes me a couple of days to really get going. Uh, of course, don't forget that my, um, my vocabulary is uh, stopped when I was 10. And also, there's a lot of slang, just like there is here. So sometimes when my cousins speak, when I say speak, I mean they write regular um, French, French that I learned, I understand them. But if they start writing in today's slang, I have no idea what they're saying. <laughs> None. So. Okay, so who else has a question? Any more questions? Yeah. Ask, did you ever see, and what was it like if you saw um, any of like during the war aftermath of like bombings or raids or anything? Well, I, I mean, I saw, I saw the bombing when, yeah. where I, where I was living, you know, but like in towns nearby while you're traveling, or you no, know, well, I didn't travel first of all, except to go to, um, <laughs> except to go and get, and get all my fingerprints taken before we left. Um, actually, my father, I did go with my father to Paris. He met his brother. And they went to the town where my grandparents had been taken. And they got to the apartment where my grandparents, and I went with them. And they got to the apartment where my grandparents, you know, had been taken. And the dishes were still in the sink. Uh, and they tried to find out who was responsible because it was the French police that took them. And, and instead of warning them, it was the French police who took them. And uh, they, you know, nobody, nobody wanted to claim that responsibility and they, they left, you know, without getting really any satisfaction. Okay, who else had a question? Okay. okay. These will be the last three questions. Okay. Um, what job? Did, what jobs did your parents have when you came to Well, first my father was a butcher, so thank goodness he had that trade. Mm -hmm. And then, at first he started working in a factory. It was a paint factory that was owned by a relative. And he used to come home covered in aluminum paint mm -hmm. because it was one of those factories. And then he got a job with the butch as a butcher. And later on, he got a little store. He had a little grocery store, and then he had a little um, 
hobby shop and uh, and my mother always helped him, you know. Well, she had other jobs. She worked. She had every kind of job you could imagine. She gave me a list once. She had every kind of job you could imagine. You know, they used to have, I don't know if they still do, they used to have machines where you could uh, put money in, you'd get a hot dog, you know, in different stores, and she would fill the machines. She worked in a flower store. She worked making candies, chocolate candies. She, I mean, she had every job you can imagine, okay? And all manual jobs. She did become a, a retail salesperson in her later years. She worked till she was 70, yeah. Okay, the next question? That one. Uh, I remember correctly, you um, mentioned the phony war earlier, and that was when Hitler was getting a lot of appeasement from other countries, if I remember correctly. Yeah. And what, what was your opinion on that? Did you think that would actually work? Or? You know, with him, when I say the phony war, I guess they, basically I know that my father always said it. You know, nobody was really fighting that hard, you know. <laughs> Yeah. You can talk about a little more about that on your tour too. Okay, she had one more question back there. Um, have you met any other Holocaust survivors other than your family? Ah, uh, sure. Uh, I've met people here and in different places. Yeah. But, you know, everybody has a different story. There's a lot of Holocaust survivors, especially the ones um, who lived in Poland, who were uh, in, in concentration camps. Or there's uh, one survivor who, who was a prisoner in a French camp, because uh, the French had also detention camps. and lived in a castle for a while and uh, I mean every everybody has a different story